I knew that the space was very diverse, but unfortunately the output from like, uh, you know, video game essayists and commentators were like in incredibly right wing. Yeah. And I think that they were radicalizing a lot of people. YouTube probably played a big role in that too, like the YouTube algorithm. But I saw that and I was like, this is not right. I think there are a lot of people that also would understand my perspective uh, and would probably mesh better uh, with my uh, worldview than the great replacement. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is Hassan Piker, one of Gen Z's most influential political commentators. He's probably most famous for a 2020 Among Us stream where he played the popular video game with Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and a series of other prominent Twitch personalities. Since then, Hassan's reach has grown rapidly. Today, he has a dedicated following of 2.5 million, which he streams to for eight hours a day, seven days a week, often attracting more than 500,000 viewers. Hassan is known for his casual approach to political commentary, which is to say that he says whatever he thinks and does not give much of a shit what people think. I thought it was especially useful to hear Hassan's perspective as someone with a young, politically engaged audience who's thought a lot about persuasion and media in our extremely online era. Here's Hassan Piker. Hassan Piker, welcome to Offline. Thank you for having me. This is incredibly professional. I didn't even realize, like, I did not realize how crazy this was. Didn't you guys used to like yeah. shoot out of the cast studio or whatever? There was that. Yeah. We also had an office um, uh, like around La Cienega uh, that was like across from a strip club and that had one bathroom in the kitchen. So that was our first. Yeah. <laughs> so this is better than that. I I mean, I have a podcast. I have two podcasts uh, and I shoot out of my living room. We did that. Well, <laughs> I shoot out of my studio, I guess. Living room converted to a studio. We like refurbished this studio right before the pandemic. And then we all uh, recorded out of our homes for about a, a year and a half. Yeah. Um, I want to start out with the biggest media news of the week. Maybe the year you adopted a puppy. Yeah. How's your first week as a dog dad? It was terrible. <laughs> I, I completely forgot what it was like. Um, it's been a very long time since I had a puppy. I'm sick. Um, I've been sleeping, you know, around two hours. Is that as much oh. as she lets me sleep, basically? How many weeks, months? Is she? She's seven weeks old. Oh, like, seven she's like, weeks. Yeah, so you're like at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, that's brutal. So she sleeps all day. And then, I mean, that's what puppies do. Until she wakes up and she's like, I need playtime right now. And then she sleeps at night for, you know, she she's up at night pooping and peeing everywhere. When we got a puppy when we moved here in 2014, and at the time I was working out of our house in West Hollywood and my, my um, wife uh, was at working uh, at a PR place, she came home. I was taking care she of the puppy. She used to do PR for us. Oh, yeah, you know, you know Emily, I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> so she's, she's, when, so, back when I used to work at the Young Turks. So Emily comes home from, from Sunshine, and I'm sitting there just covered in shit because <laughs> Leo was in the crate, and they're like, oh, they don't shit in the crate. That's no. the whole thing. But he did shit in the crate as a puppy, yeah. and I was just like on the phone with my mom. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? There's shit everywhere. It was yeah, and you're like miserable. freaking out because you're like, is there something wrong with this dog? <laughs> It's like, no, they do that. The idea is that, like, they won't shit where they sleep. That's a lie. Everyone told us when we had a puppy, like, well, it's good training for a kid. I'll just say, uh, having not. a kid. I, I know, it's, like, it's so much harder, <laughs> like, infinitely harder to have a child. Yeah. Now we have our dog, and I'm like, oh, Leo, you were so easy. Yeah. So just, yeah, it, it, yeah animals are like autopilot. They, yeah. It, Once kids, they get trained, you're like, yeah, good to go. Kids, kids can't do anything. You, nope. you put a sandwich in front of a kid, he doesn't know what's going on. Nope. And yeah. every new stage is something else you got to worry about. Um, yeah. All right, let's get to uh, media and politics here. You talked about um, Fox firing Tucker Carlson earlier this week. Who knows if we'll ever find out the real reason uh, they shit can their most profitable white nationalist. Um, but I'm curious, like, how much of that show's success do you think was driven by Tucker? And how much was because of the platform that a primetime Fox show provides whatever host is filming. That's it. a really good question because um, the other formerly shit canned uh, <laughs> host also was kind of popping as well, Bill O'Reilly. Right. 
and um, it could have something to do with that slot. I think Rupert Murdoch was basically making that bet. He was like, no, this is the slot. It's not the person that you put in the slot. I think marginally it will improve no matter what happens because Tucker Carlson is a very dangerous white nationalist propagandist who is like ideologically invested in a white nationalist project. Unlike, you know, Sean Hannity is just like regular Republican, just, you know, he's, he's just still, like a hack. He's like a he's like a, a Trump lackey, yeah. you know, yeah, like, he's a regular Republican bootlicker. He will, you know, a brown nose Donald Trump or whoever's in power. You know, he's he's a guy. Uh, he's a machine guy. Tucker is a bit like that, too. But he's he also, I think, has like consistent white nationalist ideological principles, which I find very scary, like additionally scary in yeah. comparison to your average run-of-the-mill uh, Republican racist guy. Um, but uh, you, you you do bring up a really interesting point. Um, I think it's partially because it's primetime Fox News, but I also do think that, um, you know, they are probably not going to find a guy like Tucker again. I, I, I tend to agree. I also don't know that Tucker will be able to find that level of success somewhere else because I just don't know that there are platforms as big or influential as Fox right you now. You are so right. Yeah. I, I I have I, I looked into this as a matter of fact with Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. Um after, you know, the seven hundred thousandth lawsuit about Bill O'Reilly trying to sexually harass an intern or, or telling them, you know, to use a loofah uh, <laughs> like the phone or whatever. Um after he got fired um, Bill O'Reilly's website gets like I think one million hits a month, yeah. whereas the Fox News website gets, uh, and Fox News website is definitely not their main like you know their their main revenue driver at all, but it gets like three hundred twenty seven million a month I think. Yeah. So like you know Bill O'Reilly's podcast is number seventy two on the Apple charts for news. It's he was number one. like he got an abortion a, a doctor who used to perform abortions murdered, you know what I mean? Yeah, George he, Tiller was murdered because of Bill O'Reilly. He used to call him Tiller Tiller the baby killer, and then someone went to the church that he was at and shot this guy. That's how popular and 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 prolific and uh, important Bill O'Reilly was, and now. He's got a fucking podcast that, like, I mean, you wouldn't have him on as a guest. You'd be like, I don't even fucking. <laughs> I didn't even know he had a podcast. Yeah, I know he's, like, still right. writing, like, killing linking books or, like, he's every once in a while he turns out a book that, like, goes to the yeah. top of the, uh, the, the charts there. But other than that, like, Glenn Beck, Bill O'Reilly, Megyn Kelly, yeah. none of them have found the same yeah, success Glenn they Beck, uh, another absolute failure of a, of a media platform that's like constantly in a state of disarray so they're just like always looking for the new vampire billionaire donor yeah. to come in and just be like save us please <laughs> um you know there's an industry for it they, they got yeah. like great make work programs for these fail sons well you are someone who, like me and my co-hosts, started your show in part because you were worried about the, the reach and influence of right-wing propaganda, especially among young people. When you started doing political analysis for Young Turks, did you have a theory of the case as to how you'd reach people and persuade them not to buy into the rights bullshit? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I always thought was that the Democratic Party is just god-awful. And now I think it's by design, but that's a whole different subject. Um, but I, I thought that they were just like really bad mm. at uh, messaging to anyone, really. Uh, anyone other than like a very specific zip code where like of like New York Times subscribers <laughs> that are like uh, more invested in this notion of like, you know, Americans following their profoundly important civic duties and and you know people who just care about um civility over anything else you know mm. what i mean like uh, the the diane feinstein shouldn't be uh forced to retire actually because she's a girl boss crowd like um yeah could be a little clubby yeah it, it's just like outside of that most people are just like dude please like d i'm looking at the 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 state of the republican party at the state legislature level and they're literally they just signed like another murder trans teenager bill uh, and they're passing it through the state legislature people are protesting it doesn't matter they're like you know beating the shit out of the protesters with the cops meanwhile you know you're you're over here talking about civility like what the fuck's going on like most people in the Democratic Party are assuming defensive posture in voting. Anyway, I, I went into this like grand theory, but uh, my point is, 
in spite of all of that, they are still very bad at messaging. And I thought, you know, one of the main ways to uh, communicate to people my personal desires uh, and my personal politics is just by being a normal guy, <laughs> you know, instead of being this like kind of pedantic, uh, academia focused, uptight person who's like uh, doing way too much cultural analysis <laughs> in a similar vein to like what Republicans do, but at least Republicans are doing it in a funny way. Yeah. Well, that I mean, yeah. <laughs> Has your theory of the case sort of changed at all over the years since you've been doing this as the media landscape and the political environment has changed quite a bit over the, the last several years? I mean, not really. Yeah. I think in many ways, um, the the basics are still there for me. I've only become more pessimistic mm. and about politics, democracy. Yeah, all, all of, of those things for yeah. sure. And on top of that, I've become more, um, I guess, uh, how, how do I describe this? I, I think the fundamentals that I originally started off with, uh, whether it be like media being an arm of capital and, and reinforcing and, and communicating and normalizing the oppression that people feel under unjustifiable hierarchies or, uh, you know, uh, anything that Noam Chomsky's written about the media manufacturing consent, like I, I, those were those were my starting. That was my starting point. That was the the fundamentals. That was the bare bones of what I believed in. But I was like, maybe there's some people out there that are you know doughy eyed and and they have a different perspective and it's not like that. Um, and no, I went back to square one and I am more of a firm believer in that now than I was before. So I think that's what happened. Um. Last week, I talked to Laura Bates, who spent a lot of time researching and writing about how the Internet is radicalizing young men. They start with, you know, these lightly misogynistic videos and memes, and then they end up Jordan Peterson fans or yeah. incels or even worse. How, um, how do you think about what's required to prevent that kind of radicalization? And like, do you think about that while you do your show? Yeah, no, for sure. I do that all the time. I mean, it's it's something that I'm trying to explain to people. Um, quite frequently, a lot of people on the left, on the hyper online uh, side of things, will look to someone like myself and go, "That guy's too broy. Like he mm. seems like he's gonna say something that's like a microaggression or whatever." And I'm like, "No, that's like the point. That's me. Like that's how I am. If you are here and if you've been following me for the past ten years, you know what I believe. You know what my perspective is. You know what I've been advocating for." It's all online. Like, it's not something that I hide. I've been getting death threats over it for the fucking past decade. Um, so you can look to that and see if I am those things. Yeah. Or you could just continue hyper-focusing on the aesthetics. The aesthetics are important, though, because I think that, um, you know, we are primal lizard brain idiots for the most part. And we look to someone that, um, that we can identify with. And um, I think that for a lot of people online, they just look to someone like myself and they're like, oh, this guy is, is you know, he's not uh, super uptight, super academic. He calls himself a dumbass, which I am. Um, and I think that that resemble that that is something that they um, that, you know, they vibe with, they mesh with. Uh, whereas, uh, obviously, I don't think I can deconstruct the systems themselves. And there is a reason why. Um, a guy like Andrew Tate can like basically have this torpedo effect where um, he just blows up. He's, he takes off like a rocket ship out of nowhere because he's like riding for misogyny. Yeah. And there's always going to be much larger fans or people who are socially conditioned and have these biases baked in and, and want to have those biases reinforced. So there's a lot more fans of misogyny. Uh, so therefore there are a lot of people who can take advantage of that rather than vice versa, like deconstruct those components and, and try to, uh, re-educate people. Um, but, uh, but yeah, ultimately I do my very best to just be a normal person and explain to people where they're at. Are you constantly weighing it all in your head as you're speaking? Like, okay, I want to be real. I want to be myself. I don't want to say something but i also don't want to say something too offensive or that <laughs> people might i think that's offensive what i just said but i don't really give a shit like how do you i feel like you are not worried about being canceled <laughs> no 
uh, because it's bullshit. It's not a real thing. It's like something that podcasts talk about all the fucking time. But like the reality is, it's not a real thing. It's just like, you know what cancel culture is? You know who cancel culture is real for? The dude that works at fucking Jiffy Loop. Okay. Yeah. You can get can if you're like a regular guy listening to this podcast, you can get quote unquote canceled. Why? Because. You know, you have no labor protections, so your boss could just be like, I don't like you, you're fucking fired, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's cancellation, that's like what a cancellation would be, ostensibly. Um, podcasters don't have those problems, so I think that in a way, it's a very um, it's a very fun way for podcasters to make it seem like, I'm just like you, what's happening to me can happen to you, you know how like Trump is like... If I am convicted of a crime, <laughs> you can be after too. You. And yeah. it's like, yeah, that's a very weirdly specific, you know, I don't think the Manhattan DA is going to fucking charge anyone else for paying hush money to a porn star, possibly through campaign donations, and your lawyer went to fucking jail for it already. Like, that's like an insanely specific thing to the average Joe. You know, the average Joe would have been in jail, uh, you know, 10 steps before you. Yeah. Right. It's the same concept, it's the same principle. Having said that, it's really fucking annoying. It is profoundly annoying. Cancel culture. Um, people misconstrue what you're saying all the time. I speak for eight to ten hours every day. Uh, you know, my mind rushes in a million different directions. I have ADHD, as you can probably tell. It's very difficult for me to, to you know, coherently describe exactly what I believe. Sometimes people misconstrue it. Sometimes people weaponize it. It's yeah. like a very normal part of this media landscape that we live in. Um, ultimately, you can only be "quote unquote" canceled by in the in the podcast world, at least, or in the media world, by your own fans. Offline is brought to you by Manakura. Did you know that the best tasting honey on the planet comes from New Zealand? It's called Manuka honey. In the remote and magical forests of New Zealand, the bees feed on the nectar of the Manuka tea tree, making a super honey that's unlike anything you have ever seen or tasted before. Manukura has absolutely mastered the art of beekeeping. Their super honey is always 100% raw and has a rich and creamy texture that's unlike anything you've ever tried before. It's a super honey. You know what a super honey is? What? What well, is it? It's because of its unique antioxidants and prebiotics as well as a natural antibacterial compound called MGO that only comes from the nectar of this tea tree. This is delicious honey. It's, it's great. Uh, I really like it. Whoever thought there was a special delicious honey from New Zealand, well, they they nailed it here. I know. Put on an apple earlier earlier this week. It contains nutrients that support optimal immune and digestive health. Every batch is 100% traceable with a unique QR code on every jar. You can verify potency, purity, and even learn about the specific beekeeper that harvested your honey. Great job, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> you can try a spoonful or you can add it to tea, coffee, pancakes, you name it. The creamy caramel texture melts in your mouth. It's unlike anything you've ever tried. Manukura honey is available in a range of easy-to-use formats, including squeeze bottles and compostable honey sticks, so you can eat it straight or add to your favorite food and drinks. If you head to manukura.com slash offline or use code offline, you'll automatically get a free pack of honey sticks with your order of $15 value. That's M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash offline or use code offline to get a free pack of compostable honey sticks with your order. You haven't tasted or seen honey like this before, so indulge and try some honey with superpowers from Manukura. Offline is brought to you by Sundays. Sundays is air-dried dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients. Sundays was co-founded by Dr. Tori, who's a practicing veterinarian. Sundays contains 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and 0% synthetic nutrients. Besides USDA beef and all-natural chicken, you'll find digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger, plus disease-fighting antioxidants. Dog parents report noticeable health improvements in their pups, including softer fur, fresher breath, better poops, and more energy. I better can attest poops. as a dog parent. Plus, how does it help the dogs? <laughs> <laughs> I tried some. I'm as regular as I've ever been. Uh, Sundays is convenient. Unlike other fresh dog food, Sundays is zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. Sundays is shelf-stable, which makes it easy to feed your pup top quality food. Every order ships right to your door, so you'll never worry about running out of dog food again. Sundays cost 40% less than other health dog food brands because Sundays doesn't waste money shipping frozen packages. 
Instead, they spend on what matters, sourcing the best all-natural ingredients for your pup. We worked out a special deal for our dog-loving listeners. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash offline or use code offline at checkout. That's S-U-N-D-A-Y-S-F-O-R-D-O-G-S dot com forward slash offline. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. Offline is brought to you by Mosh. If you're busy and constantly on the go like me, you need to try Mosh. It's a protein bar made for your brain. With six delicious flavors, each mosh bar includes 12 grams of protein and is made with ingredients that support brain health like ashwagandha, lion's mane, collagen, and omega-3s. At 160 calories and only one gram of sugar, mosh protein bars are the guilt-free snack your brain and body will crave. Your brain is your number one tool, which is why mosh protein bars were mindfully formulated by some of the top (laughs) neuroscientists and functional nutritionists. Heart's like, the heart gets the call being like, hey, (laughs) listen, I'm sorry, but you didn't get it. Hey, you're number two. (laughs) You're vital. Everyone loves you, but you didn't get it. Look, (laughs) mosh can help your entire body. Founded by Patrick Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver, Mosh is a mission-driven brain health and wellness company that donates a portion of all proceeds to support women's brain research through the Women's Alzheimer's Movement at Cleveland Clinic. We've had these Mosh bars around the office. They're very good. We can't keep them in stock. You can't know, keep them around because everyone loves them. Um, they're, they're like Maria Pat. Great fucking job. They're <laughs> <laughs> way to go. They're delicious. They're great. They're good for you. Don't settle for a mediocre snack when you can nourish your body and mind with the fuel it needs to succeed. So whether you're at the gym, on the go, or just living your best life, Mosh Protein Bars will keep your brain and body fit-fueled and feeling good. Head to moshlife.com slash offline to save 20% off, plus free shipping on your first six-count trial pack. That's 20% off, plus free shipping on your first six-count trial pack, which includes all six mouth-watering flavors. M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash offline. You've said that the um, the left can be very successfully turned into a cartoonish depiction of a hysterical person, someone who doesn't see any joy in life. I want to show people that you can be a progressive and not be a total fucking scold. I think about this constantly, uh-huh. especially over the last couple of years. What is it about the left, do you think, that lends itself to that caricature? Um, I think people are well-intentioned uh, overall. Mm. I want to believe that they're well-intentioned overall. And if you're like a very empathetic person and um, then you don't understand co- the context or nuance behind like, you know, a piece of comedy or something, um, and you feel like the only place that you have any kind of power in an otherwise, uh, you know, in an otherwise cruel world where you feel completely powerless because you can't do anything about like actual racism, um, like systemic failures, you can't do anything about reforming the criminal justice system. Um, You hyper focus on, you know, cultural analysis and you hyper focus on like what TV show you can kind of uh, yell about or you hyper focus on like language and changing language. And and, um, I think that one of the major components of the left behaving this way sometimes, especially online, is that it's the only thing they know and it's the only thing that they've gotten like positive reinforcement out of. And by positive reinforcement, I mean like a corporation actually reacting Mm. and saying, sorry, we fucked up. We're going to change it. Um, uh, Because, you know, no matter how much you yell at the Democratic Party, like they are still going to give extra armored personnel carriers to the police force. You know what I mean? Like they're not fixing the fucking potholes. Sorry. Uh, The the cops need extra Kevlar vests and, and, you know, APCs. Um, but at least, like, I can get a TV show to change someone that worked there, like, change uh, uh, the cast of a TV show, and then all of a sudden I feel like I've done something. So that's one component. The other uh, thing that I have experienced a lot on Twitch, where I'm live every day and I, like, talk to people nonstop, constantly. I have an arena full of people listening, but they can also say something back to me and I will read it in real time. Um, one of the things I've actually noticed is that people are very narcissistic. <laughs> I know yeah. it's ironic to, for me to say this because it's like I'm a fucking Twitch streamer. Like, I'm just a regular dude who thinks like everyone has to hear what I have to say. You know, we're podcasters, white guys doing podcasts, you yeah. know? Wow. Fucking Crazy. Yeah, very unique. <laughs> um, but one thing I have noticed is that people, a lot of people will utilize or rather weaponize like the empathetic state that leftists have because like their politics are one of compassion, usually, right? Yeah. To center the conversation around themselves. Uh, one thing I, uh, one immediate uh, you know, example of this that comes to mind from Twitter at least is like when the Kellogg's workers were on strike and they were demanding that you, you know, don't cross the picket line and you don't actually buy something from Kellogg's. 
during that duration. And there was someone being like, no one is ready for that conversation, but I have like a food sensory issue and I have to eat Frosted Flakes, sweetie. And it's like, dude, you didn't have to fucking tweet that at all. You just did that because you are a fucking narcissist. You want to be like, no, center the conversation about workers' rights around me, a person, uh, you know, who is not even revolved in the in the production process in this regard, but is a worker elsewhere who probably would want solidarity if they were also in a similar predicament. But it's just like yeah, we're and, very... And when I say that person is like, don't, don't eat the Kellogg's if that's your issue for sure. And then if someone yells at you for not expressing solidarity to the workers, then explain your situation. Yeah, but there is a sort yeah. of a, 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 an impulse to just go ahead. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like you could have literally just shut the fuck up and ate all the Frosted Flakes <laughs> on the planet. Like no one would know. But you chose to like make this a conversation point because you were like, oh, people are blindsided. Like it's utilizing or rather weaponizing the intersectionality um, of, of leftist movements to just say, look at me, look at what I have to say. I have something to say and I need everybody to hear it. And I think that um, the DSA, for example, uh, even though they do great work in many uh, respects, will oftentimes fall uh, uh, prey to this, will fall victim to this, where I'm just like, my big principle always is like, I don't give a fuck, just shut the fuck up, you're here to listen. Uh, if you come in here and, and you know start chirping about some random shit, like I'm gonna ban you. Um, I think we need to, yeah, we need more of a Stalinist approach in the DSA <laughs> uh, to, to, that the, that's, to, that's to start, say. yeah, to, to start purging the counter revolutionaries I mean, and the anarchists. No, I'm just kidding. Your, your, <laughs> your point about all of this happening in the absence of larger structural change that would help marginalized communities, I think, is is really the key of this because yeah. there's like. Obviously, like passing a bunch of policies, protecting rights for all people who have been marginalized and have been for years and years and years, like that is the right way to go. That's not happening. And so then only being able to exert your power on social media. I mean, how much is, I feel like a lot of this is social media driven in a way that it like we didn't have this kind of thing about the left being very scoldy five, six, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Well, Maybe it's longer. Like, no, it's definitely longer than that. I think like I like the the earlier versions of this probably go back to like what uh, Rainbow Coalition, Jesse Jackson, and then like maybe uh, uh, it was Howard Dean. Yeah, like the blogosphere that started propping up around the Howard Dean era. But like those OG podcasters and OG radio hosts were like you know dudes like Sam Cedar. You know what I mean? Or even fucking Mark Marin yeah. um, at the time. You know, Air America guys, like, they they didn't give a shit about any of that stuff. This is like, um, it's not it's not new necessarily, but it's uh, uh, it, it's certainly become way more prominent on social media. I think, like, uh, it, it's basically like the Tumblr uh, contamination. Like, it, 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 ba- it, it, when Tumblr eliminated pornography on their on their platform everyone that was in tumblr doing exactly these kind of kinds of conversations where they were like hyper medicalizing every condition and like um you know uh, uh, like constantly uh, utilizing clinical psychology terms in their daily lives like uh, uh super easily and and oftentimes in the wrong ways uh, all of those people breached, uh, you know, the the containment zone, and then they went to Twitter, they went to TikTok, and now they're everywhere, <laughs> and <laughs> and they just, you know, everyone talks like this. Republicans talk like this. Yeah, well, which I, is funny, but that's uh, that's telling, right? Like, I think that social media has helped accelerate this trend. And you point out it's about narcissism in a way. Yeah. But that's what social media does. It puts you at the center of everything, right? It's your likes, your follows, your opinions. And I think that, like, you know, that's sort of in line with a a conservative philosophy, which is just, you know, about extreme individualism. But on our side, like, like the progressive movement succeeds when there is solidarity, when you realize like I have issues, someone else has issues and I have to care about their issues and their rights as well as mine. And you have to have that like true intersectionality. (laughs) And I don't know that social media uh, really allows for that. No, the, the unfortunate reality is that like, I can't believe I'm using like a right wing terminology almost for this, but like 
identity politics in the way that it's understood in America through the American exceptionalist, American individualist lens is like literally reactionary so much so that I believe it was a part of the CIA handbook to very clearly infiltrate like any kind of anti-capitalist uh, space and, and anti-capitalist organizing and disrupt it by utilizing specific talking points like, uh, you know, bring up random irrelevant differences all the time and make them the main point of the focal point of conversation as a means to hold up any kind of organizing is literally written in the CIA handbook for leftist infiltration. I mean, it's certainly what Russia tried to do with its propaganda. <laughs> I mean, like I mean, other countries it, know that's our weakness, too. Yeah, yeah. it's it's very successful. Uh, it's because it's a it's a major security threat in, in many respects that like. Americans personally think I'm an American citizen. I believe that I have very unique thoughts that no one has ever thought before. And by virtue of me having come up with this very unique thought, because I'm fucking awesome, like everyone needs to hear me out, no matter how fucking stupid it is. <laughs> and I just, I'm always like, no, man, that's really fucking stupid. Like you, you don't know anything about vaccine science. You just, <laughs> just because you're like, you know, you thought you cooked this up doesn't make you have to have a platform like you don't have to say these things yeah but every, everyone everyone gets a pla everyone deserves a platform today yeah you know? and it's everyone very deserves stupid. Rage. um the other big issue i think with social media uh, as it relates to politics is it, it, i feel like it has led people and cable news started this trend but it's led a lot of people to believe that it's no longer worth trying to persuade people who don't share all of your political views yeah i disagree with that yeah you i was gonna say you're a leftist who very much believes in doing the work of persuasion and i always wonder when i come across someone like this like how'd you end up like that i'm just a annoying stubborn guy i think i've also had changes in my own personal politics uh where you know in some ways i've become i guess more radicalized throughout the years but um but in many in many ways like way more tolerant like i um i talk about transphobia a lot right i'm a cishet white guy um I, I had transphobic opinions uh, 10 years ago. Many of my trans viewers even had transphobic opinions, you know, 10 years ago. Internalized transphobia is a huge uh, part of this. Why? Because gender is like a very rigid thing that we associate with ourselves. Though, even though it's socially learned, even though it's an expression, um, we reinforce that through every facet of society. You, get, you can't play with Barbies. You got to play with G.I. Joe's for a boy, right? Like you got to wear blue. Even though if you look at like uh, FDR, when uh, he was a baby, he just looks like a little girl. Like he's, he's got dress on, his hair is long. Like those concepts have changed throughout time, but they become infinitely more rigid in contemporary society. And it's very personal to a lot of people, like what their gender is. So when they see uh, someone break that uh, that that false notion that gender is actually biological and is very rigid and it, it is very important to me, what the fuck, it breaks their brain. So that's the reason why, um, and trans activists say this all the time, like the overwhelming majority of, of Americans and the way that they receive trans people or the way that they think about trans people is just, they don't really think about trans people at all. They just have apathy. So you can go either in either direction after that. You meet a trans person, they're chill, you start learning and, and developing empathy for them, or you become this like insanely transphobic person like Matt Walsh. And luckily, most Americans are not like Matt Walsh. Right. Um, but uh, why did I describe all of this? It's because I personally went through that journey of like understanding and developing empathy for trans people and became an advocate for trans rights. And um, and I think that everyone is capable of of becoming more open minded and reforming, and you know learning new things. And uh, it's it's it certainly is one aspect of I guess the overall left is that there is this uh, there is this false notion of justice that comes from uh, thinking that like people are infallible people are supposed to be perfect they're not supposed to like have uh, any sort of bad opinions if you have any sort of bad opinions in the past you have to hide it if you have any sort of bad opinions now we can't have disagreements that means you're a bad person yeah um it's a bit of a cartoon because most people don't actually behave like that in the real world right never. you would never fucking sit across uh, someone and be like oh wow you have a disagreement about like uh, i don't know fucking uh, the criminal justice system, you're a fascist. And also, I'm going to call like 30 people over to the table and have them all start screaming at you. <laughs> yeah, like that would never happen, right? Um, so my point is 
that uh, everyone, with the exception of like professional Republicans, yeah, uh, you know, professional commentators, I would say, everyone in the margins, uh, everyone in the, and everyone has a, ca- a capability of changing their opinion on a particular matter. I don't think it happens through like contentious debate in the way that like a lot of people uh, claim it does. I think that's just more for uh, solidifying your positioning. Um, and, and there is always a 20% in the middle that you could, you know, bring to your side, but like debates are not really about the truth. They're just about whose uh, rhetoric is better overall. But I, I try to do that through just overall being a chill guy who talks about these issues, yeah. but well, is like an influencer otherwise. I think that people who are intensely online, who pay super close attention to politics, they are exposed to a lot of people with their views. They're exposed to a lot of people with the polar opposite view. And they're not exposed to most people in this country who, first of all, don't really have a lot of political opinions, uh, or at least don't have strong ones, don't really pay close attention to the news. And when they do have political opinions, a lot of times they're complicated and they have different positions on different issues. And I'm not saying that like we should just say, okay, well, because we got to compromise, we shouldn't we shouldn't go after those people. We should just let them I think we should persuade them. But what I'm saying is like people people are gettable. Most people are gettable if you can sit down and persuade them because like you said, we've all gone through these sort of changes and you have to think, oh, what persuaded me? Was it someone screaming at me or was it someone trying to like reason with me and talk through it and point out evidence and talk about values? Like there's just, there's a way that people can be persuaded still. I just think it's hidden all the time. For the record, I totally understand why people are angry all the time. Oh yeah. Um, Oh yeah. Especially online. Like I get it. Especially if you're trans, if you're like, uh, you know, if you're like a queer black teenager, you see so much, you see so much violence against black people, you see so much violence against queer people. Um, And, you know, that frustrates you. You feel like you constantly are on the defense. You got your guard up. And there's uh, very valid reasons for you to, you know, for you to behave like that. So when you're always on the defensive, you you pop off on people. So I'm not saying like all, all matter of like, uh, vitriolic or angry sentiment expressed by leftists online is is completely stupid. I just mean that like um, you know there are components of charitability that that have been absolutely lost uh, when a compassionate movement surrounding solidarity does start with foundational principles of taking on emotional labor every now and then, um, or at least relegating those responsibilities to someone who can if they are uh, coming from a point of privilege. Um, I'm, of course, talking about myself here, but, you know, these are these are things you can do and not constantly trying to center yourself in uh, in every conversation, like, and, and you know, figuring out that there is a, a, a larger, in order for there to be a larger systemic change, like, you know, some of these conversations are going to uh, be softened. Some mm. of these, some of these talking points are going to be softened. Um, and I also think that that work of showing generosity and grace and empathy that is different than people calling for civility. I think sometimes people get those things mixed up. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's not, I'm, it's not I'm a very <laughs> uncivil person. I'm, <laughs> I'm a fucking caveman. I'm a barbarian. Um, I say, you know, awful things, but I, I, I do try to be as compassionate as possible to those who aren't there, uh, to, to basically, uh, exhaust my charitability and take up space and take up time away from other people who are genuinely there to learn. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes happen to make mistakes as well when I just like pop off on someone from a misunderstanding. Um, but um, overall, my main goal is just like, you know, make educational content that's entertaining. And, uh, I try to do that and I want everyone to have like, I want the most egalitarian, I want the most egalitarian open way, uh, to do that as possible, which is you come into the chat, you follow for 10 minutes, you can say whatever you want. Very likely I'm going to read it. Yeah. Um, every leftist's favorite president, Joe Biden, uh, just announced he's running for reelection. Yeah. How are you feeling about a Biden Trump rematch? I mean, at this point, like, um, I've been so super checked out. Like, I, I, Bernie Sanders came out and was like, I'm not running. I'm endorsing him. And I was like, yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah. Um, yeah, this time, well, like, you got the incumbents advantage. If I put my, like, Democratic Party thinking hat on, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, uh, anytime I talk about, like, electoral politics, like, I have to do that. Um, 
It, it does make sense, like, because, I mean, Kamala Harris is awful. You're not a fan, not a no, Kamala Harris No, she's fan. so uncharismatic, like, and, and they also cooked her, like, not only is she so supremely uncharismatic, they also put her on, like, the worst assignments possible for a VP. Like, it almost felt like the Joe Biden team, I don't even think Biden was doing this personally, were just like, yeah, get fucked. You know? <laughs> That's your... Because, that, like, he's I mean, that old. does happen to VPs a lot. I know, but, like, if you're 800 years old, like, you should probably be like, oh, this is the next president, potentially. Yeah. Like, you should groom the, that person to be the next president, not, like... Put them on toxic, uh, hazardous waste duty. Um, here's, here's what I was worried about Kamala Harris, though, is that, like, this goes back to our earlier conversation, which is, like, to become the first woman vice president, first uh, black, South Asian, like, to get to achieve where she has, to get to the heights that she has in politics, she has probably had to walk such a tightrope over the years, right? Because of sexism, racism, a whole bunch of stuff. And I wonder if, as a politician, that makes you a little more cautious, a little more buttoned up. And it's like one of the reasons that she does seem so. <laughs> I think I don't know. Look, That's just. Do you know? Do, there's a term uh, that the youth call Riz. Do you know what this is? No. Riz. It's like shortened for charisma. Is if you go on TikTok, yeah. you'll probably see it. Yeah. Some people have Riz, and yeah. some people don't have Riz. Ron DeSantis, no Riz. Okay. No Riz. Yeah, He's no, got no he Riz. Not. He's got no juice. Uh, he goes on television and says, it's sugar, man. And everyone's like, oh, that's gross. Stop. Please never <laughs> fucking talk ever again. Or he's like, oh, maybe if I run. You know, like, you see the fucking thing he said in Japan? He looks like a bobblehead. Yeah. Why are you in Japan? That's You're the I governor of fucking Florida. What are you like? I don't understand what he was there for. He's there to reassassination Zabe. <laughs> He was like, I'm with the Moonies on this one. We got to, or he's, he's going to go kill the guy who killed Shinzo Abe uh, to defend the, the Moonies honor. Anyway, very weird that he's in Japan in general. I guess he's trying to get his like foreign policy bona fides. Yeah. Not that like the Republican Party gives a fuck about that dumbass. And also like a trip to Japan is not really going to do that. Yeah, exactly. Or <laughs> anyway, I really, I really uh, reevaluated the, the uh, relationship between Tallahassee and, uh, you know, the, the Kobe <laughs> <Tokyo>. prefecture. <laughs> like, uh, thank you. Um, so... He doesn't have that charisma. Donald Trump does. Donald Trump is petty. He's a sassy bitch. But goddamn, does he make for good TV. Kamala Harris doesn't have that. You know, yeah. in spite of all these flaws, I think ultimately people do overlook that sort of thing. Barack Obama had it. Yeah. Barack Obama was, you know, Donald, I, I say this all the time, Donald Trump is the Barack Obama for white people. Like, where Barack Obama ran on, like, a very progressive platform didn't follow through on a lot of those, uh, you know, progressive platform uh, uh, promises, and you know, uh, I'm I'm very critical of him. I mean, I know you, you worked for the guy. I did, I did. Uh, but like, he was profoundly charismatic. Like, he was on the campaign trail. Oh my god, when he was fucking daggering Hillary Clinton on like the Iraq War stuff, like yeah. saying she's just like this, you know, corrupt institutionalist. Like, he was a <laughs> once in a lifetime charismatic figure. That really popped off for that reason, and you can't you can't build a strategy around like hoping that you're gonna have a, a, a freak like that. You know what I mean? Offline is brought to you by By Optimizers. Being a working professional is not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of stress involved in the daily grind, and if you're not careful, that stress can start to take a toll on your body, not only draining you of vital energy, but making you magnesium deficient. You're probably saying magnesium deficient. What is that? This deficiency can lead to higher levels of stress, irritability, trouble sleeping, and low energy. Mm, that's what it is then. There you go. It can even contribute to muscle cramps. You can experience a number of positive health benefits just from getting enough magnesium, including better sleep, more energy, healthy blood pressure, less irritability, stronger bones, reduced muscle cramping, even fewer migraines. But to experience these health benefits, you got to get all of the seven forms of magnesium. Magnesium Breakthrough is the only organic full-spectrum magnesium supplement that includes all seven forms of magnesium in one bottle. And for a limited time, by Optimizers, the makers of Magnesium Breakthrough, is offering additional bonus gifts. They're including free bottles of their powerful digestive enzymes, masszymes, and of their patented probiotic, P3OM. That means you're getting free gifts with purchase to try that will support your digestive system. Visit magbreakthrough.com slash offline and enter offline10 to activate this exclusive limited time offer. Offline is brought to you by Karyuma, the cool sustainable sneaker company loved by skaters, surfers, and celebs. 
Karyuma is a B Corp certified company known for their reforestation program and consciously crafted kicks. Every sustainable made sneaker sold plants two trees in the Brazilian rainforest. Sneakers that plant trees, can you say that about any of your other shoes? Mm, not no. That I, not that I can think of. Not, no. No. Starting April 22nd through April 30th, they're upping their efforts in celebration of Earth Day and planting 10 trees. That's right, 10 trees for every pair sold. If new shoes have been on your mind, now's the time to get that fresh pair of kicks in time for spring. If you're in search of a good-looking, ultra-comfy, and consciously crafted sneaker to sport this spring season, look no further. With over 33,000 five-star reviews and having just cleared a 77,000 person wait list, Akalo is all the rave and for a reason. It's made with durable organic cotton canvas. These versatile kicks come in a selection of colors and prints to fit any personality, even Ashton Kutchner's. Kutchner. Kutchner? It's like a cross between... um, Jared, uh, Kushner. Jared Kushner and Ashton Kutcher, yeah. Uh, invest in our planet and plant trees with Snoopy and Friends This Earth Day with Karyuma's limited edition collaboration with Peanuts. With depictions of Snoopy and Woodstock planting trees and admiring the earth, these shoes are the perfect wearable reminder to treat our home with tender loving care this Earth Day and beyond. Karyuma ships all their sneakers free and fast in the USA and offers worldwide shipping and 60-day free returns. They deliver right to your door using single box recycled packaging. And for a limited time, offline listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Karyuma sneakers. Go to cariuma.com slash offline to get 15% off. That's cariuma.com slash offline for 15% off only for a limited time. Do you think, uh, what do you think about Biden? I mean, he, that's someone who I would not say is the is the most charismatic. <laughs> no, that's but what he's, I mean. he's president of the United States right now. I know, because at that point, like, Donald Trump literally got COVID before the election, which, like, re-emerged the fear that the American population had about how fucking terrible of a job he had done with COVID. The economy was tanking. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like the Here's worst the with- possible storm for Donald Trump. Look, I've always liked Joe Biden as a person. When I was in the White House, I worked with him. I thought he was, he's just a, a kind, generous soul, right? I, he, I, he was not my choice in the primary <laughs> by any means. I did, not only was he not my choice, I didn't think he would win. He did. And I actually think uh, sometimes I do the experiment, okay, if it was... Bernie Sanders uh, in office over the last couple of years, if I really look through every single decision point, what would he have done differently or what would he have been able to achieve differently? And I don't know. Like, I actually think I can tell you what's that. I think one of the most important. First of all, make no mistake. Bernie Sanders would be, uh, you know, would be getting called perhaps justifiably even a a fascist American imperialist by the very same left as they ended up voting for him, including maybe even myself at certain points. And he like. There is 0% chance that Bernie Sanders would, like, legitimately, I don't know, um, take away resources from, like, Israel until they stop the apartheid. You know what I mean? Like, that was never going to happen. Like, yeah. you know, it's so, just I not. I think that's a good point that uh, that probably foreign policy where the president yeah. has the most power to do what they want is probably where Bernie yeah. might have been the most Look, different. Look, Eisenhower was right. He was wrong on a lot of things, but he was right on this one where he said, you know, the the military industrial complex is going to destroy this country is the most powerful force, the most powerful institution. Absolutely correct. It is. It is a it is the most viable industry that we have. It is profoundly important. We're going to do their bidding no matter what happens, uh, because it's like creating new opportunities for for. Uh, you know, foreign capital to come in and and seize. We, we're extracting natural resources as a consequence of that. We're constantly keeping prices down as a consequence of that. That volatility, that instability is good for like Western, uh, like other Western capitalists uh, uh, that, uh, you know, can cut into the market and like sell their own liquid petroleum or whatever the fuck, right? So um, there's all of that. Bernie Sanders was not going to change that. But what could he have done? One thing that he said that I truly believe in is something that Obama kind of said and then didn't do when he became president, which was outside forces um, that uh, our work would only begin once Bernie Sanders was in office and he would do everything in his power to ensure that like labor unions Mm -hmm. could uh, truly form and have more power in the country and become more dominant once again in the political uh, arena. And that uh, it wasn't going to be the singular individual from the top uh, you know, turning down, uh, turning around and being like, we're going to purge the, the non-believers in the Democratic Party. And, you know, I'm going to start kicking out Republicans uh, uh, from from Senate or anything like that. The president doesn't have that kind of power anyway. Um, 
unless they're Republican, then they can do whatever the fuck they want. Right. But, <laughs> but um, none of those things were going to happen. Like, but well, it feels I like think the only, it feels like the next step would be passing the PRO Act, and like yes. he couldn't get that through Congress. I think even if he couldn't get that through Congress, I think he would have weaponized the bully pulpit. Like, think about how Donald Trump utilized the bully pulpit to really beef up white supremacy, so much so that you thought, like, these decentralized... But he didn't need legislation for that. No, I know. <laughs> but my, my, my point is this. Um, he was able to get these otherwise incredibly fringe groups that mm. were, like, super decentralized to come together and, like, demonstrate... In a country that, like, killed Nazis not that fucking long ago, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they got so confident that they could do that. Um, the, the So, my point is, the president does have a very powerful weapon. It's called the bully pulpit, as you know. And I think Bernie Sanders would have been able to effectively utilize that mm. to push for more organizing outside of the political sphere so that you could have more, you know, people participation in politics in general. And... Um, uh, maybe I'm a little too naive or too hopeful, but I think that that paired up with like some legislation and and actually bullying, uh, you know, the the constant rotating villain inside of the Democratic Party would have been able to like at the very least make incremental change in the positive direction in the right direction. I was never uh, thinking that like you know Bernie's going to bring about the Green New Deal like that. You know he's yeah. not going to be able to do any of that when FDR was able to do the New Deal. There was a lot of concessions that he made still um, that we look uh, not so fondly on, uh, and it's understandable, like uh, carving out black people from uh, a lot a of these, one. you know, a lot of these amenities. Um, but there was outside pressures that forced FDR's hand. You had both the, you know, the the business plot fascist uh, capitalists that were like, let's kill this guy. This guy fucking sucks. Um, and then you also had like a, a viable coalitions of trade unionists, communists, social democrats, socialists in this country. Like Eugene Debs uh, uh, got, you know, two million votes or something like that from fucking prison. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think with Biden, it's interesting because like I, I would argue that it, we wouldn't have the, I mean, he prioritized, you know, Joe Manchin wrote the Inflation Reduction Act, obviously, but they basically, he basically gave Biden a choice, like, which policies do you want to prioritize here? I don't think he would have prioritized climate had it not been for the outside pressure from young people and climate activists to really care about climate. I don't think he would have tried to cancel student loan had it not been for a lot of outside pressure. I do, so I do think some... That's, that's, that's wild, though. Think about that. You, yo, that's like... That's like such a gimme. The student I mean, loan thing is such a easy. That's so easy. That's easy politics. I think like, it's easy. Well, I, I, look, I think it's. I, I'm very much for it. I think that the politics of it is still like. You look at the polling. It's not as popular as I would think. No, I don't believe that. What, if you look at some no. of the it, people are because people think like yeah because the media is constantly fucking up the assholes of like uh, even Nancy oh, fucking Pelosi is like they have big donors that are in student loan refinancing that literally juice up all of these fucking programs. You got like people who did literal corporate PR for debt refinancing companies that go on CNN and MSNBC and be like, is it really? fair that people are you know getting some of their uh student loan debt relief here no one's asking the question why the fuck are people you, you, also get, you also get like working class people who will say that too and they'll be like i fucking paid for college why some yeah, rich kid in in a, in a city somewhere yeah, because they're stupid <laughs> like i'm sorry you're <laughs> well, fucking that, that's you're, all i'm saying there's a lot of people you're a like, mean person and you're a stupid person yeah, if there's you a lot of that out that, there it's the, the counter to that is so simple. It's like, oh, wow. Like if there's a fucking cancer vaccine tomorrow, you'd be like, oh, well, sorry. I went through chemotherapy. You shouldn't get the I cancer vaccine. I paid for vaccine. my chemo. Yeah. yeah like what, what are you fucking insane? It's crazy. So um, I do think that it, like it is a huge frustration of mine always has been that Democrats do not break through on economic messaging, even when they try. And oftentimes they don't try. And I think like, even if you just go strictly from polling, like economic populism is very popular, right? And yet uh, it doesn't also doesn't break through because the media doesn't, We're the media is talk- bored by yeah. economic issues, unless well, it's like they, a crisis. They don't need to be, but uh, I think the media is again, uh, too invested in the other side. So. That's part of the reason why, like, whenever they talk about economic policy, they take an insanely anti-populist stance. And they oftentimes have, like, these, you know, big-brained uh, econ guys come in and talk about these issues. And then you find out that, like, you know, 
if they were wearing like a NASCAR jacket of their fucking corporate sponsors, like you'd be like, oh, I get why this guy's saying, you know, that we can't have health care in this country. You work for Cigna. Like, well, shut oh, the fuck up. But it's also, you know, like <laughs> Barack Obama said fat cats once uh, about the fucking CEOs at the banks <laughs> after yeah. the financial crisis. And we dealt with it for like a month. Maybe yeah, being like, I, I, is he some crazy populist now because he called them fat cats? Yeah, like, that's, what the fuck? that's not a bad thing. And that kind of populism literally also played a role in Donald Trump coming across like unique and genuine, despite the fact that he was a fucking spoiled uh, 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 fail son whose daddy carried him to financial prosperity, even though he kept fucking it up over and over again. Yeah. So like, it's mind boggling that this dude uh, born in New York w- with a silver spoon in his mouth was was able to to come across like uh, like he was the, the this populist leader. And he did that because he was saying things that other people were not saying. Yeah. Um, and I think that that gets lost a lot, or maybe even some people are fearful of that kind of narrative because it goes against their corporate benefactors' uh, best interests. Um, going back to uh, Joe Biden, though, um, a- a- as far as like what Joe Biden has done, I, I think that um, like I think that there are a lot of issues with uh, the Biden administration from my perspective which most Americans I don't even think uh, care about, um, you know, not not allowing the railroad workers uh, to, to truly fight for better contracts where, you know, you're forcing the hand of these like four major railroad corporations that have basically carved out the United States of America mm. as their own fucking territories. And they literally own the railroads as well as the train carts on top of them. Um like uh, they were right. Those real the, the the unions were absolutely correct on demanding that more people should be hired for the railroads and that they should get time off. Um, it, it's it was a, a totally valid thing to, to ask. And, and Joe Biden absolutely uh, did not give them that at all and utilized in the one instance where he had some power and influence, he used it in the opposite direction. Yeah, they um, were they were worried about a uh, a strike and the economic yeah. fallout and what that would do to the larger. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I totally I, I totally get that. But here's two but you're ways right in the to, moment he could have. He here, here's two pushing. ways to communicate that always. Capitalist dogma dictates that whenever there's a union uh, strike, whenever there's like even talk of a strike, work stoppage happening. That it's always at the fault of the union. It's always the workers that are actually f- causing the strike to happen. Why are they being selfish? Yeah. Why are they doing a strike? It's like there's two sides to every kind of contract negotiation. Why does the media never talk about the manager side, the boss side, the employer side, and their responsibility to offer a fair contract to these striking workers that want simply just a small fraction a of the percentage? Off. A couple days off. A small fraction of the percentage of the value that they are generating for this company. It's not like they're saying like, you know, we're overthrowing you. This is a workers council. We have a fucking vanguard that is going to control the railroad companies and the nation. Eventually they're not like, you know, rugged Marxist Leninists. They're just guys that are like, we want some time off. (laughs) I want to see my children. I want to, I want to not go to work sick. What's uh, what's your best pitch to a 20 something uh, in a swing state, who's not sure if they want or bother to vote in 2024? Um, well, I mean, I <laughs> I say this all the time on my on my stream, but um, I don't really care that much about the the uh, you know the top of the ticket. Obviously, it's you know it's the most significant, least significant thing you can do. You know what I mean? But you should absolutely vote for your ballot measures. You should absolutely learn everything you can about your ballot measures and vote for your local politicians because those guys will have immediate and tangible impacts on your life. I, uh, I'm, but you I'm would a say huge... that, but like you know, whether we get Biden or Trump seems like for all your criticisms of Biden, it's still a bit. That's a it big does, deal. Yeah, it, it there's. There's a difference between Biden and Trump. I mean, I still voted for Biden, but ultimately, uh, I totally understand why you feel powerless. I'm just saying, like, you got to get your door, you got to get your foot in the door, regardless for the for the down ballot shit. Yeah. So while you're there, vote for the guy that's marginally better. Ultimately, do I think that that is going to like dramatically change the outcome? I think that we greatly greatly exaggerate how different things are between both parties when like both parties kind of move the needle like this and the real damaging stuff happens uh, over a lifetime. Uh, The Republican Party did not eviscerate uh, abortion rights 
uh, and, and a woman's right to choose and like, you know, these fundamental liberties, the civil liberties that people took for granted for so long in one election cycle. I know that Donald Trump, uh, yeah, they won a bunch of Senate seats in uh, really conservative states. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 but like, but the reality is that was a 40 year project by yeah. the Federalist Society that was successful. Ultimately, there was billions of dollars of capital being pushed into it. You go to fucking North Carolina, you got the Federalist Society right there. UNC, UNC Law School, Federalist Society is right there. Literally, you know, plucking every fucking frat bro who's like, I want to be a lawyer one day. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know what I mean? Like, well, to your local point, working. they have put so much money over decades into focusing on local races. That's why we have fucking state legislatures that are basically like one party states now oh, in yeah. some of these Wisconsin. red states. Wisconsin. Wisconsin is fucking insane. But Wisconsin was a good example too, where I was like, I had given up. I was like, oh God, the gerrymandering there, we're fucked. And then the Supreme Court race, then we won the Supreme Court race. And I'm like, now, like, that's that's a good argument to me about like why you never give up on states like that too. yes exactly of course not yeah. I, i'm not an advocate for giving up on any state oh, yeah, whatsoever no. i'm but that's why i'm saying like focus on the, the local. real boring minutia is actually where it fucking matters yeah. like your council district uh, member is going to have more power over your immediate life uh, like you're uh, you're is going to have more tangible differences in your way of existence than uh the the fucking president uh, because like the american government runs like a machine on autopilot i think trump proved that pretty and by the way well if you get involved in local politics and you see that local politics can actually change your life and your community for the better you're more likely to be involved in politics right yeah. you're more you're, you're less likely to stop having so much distrust in the yeah. system if you can see it in front of you working yeah you want to know how you also feel that way though you want to know how we participate more Workplace organizing. Yeah. Labor unions were the reason why people uh, felt like they had a say in this process. Even if there wasn't an immediate say, and I'm not even talking about labor unions now, but um, but there was a point in time when, like, you know, you, you did feel like you had some level of influence over the Democratic Party, at least. I feel like with union participation at 10 percent, 11 percent, which is literally lower than Chile, by the way. This is a fun, this is a fact, fun fact for everybody listening at home. We wrote their fucking constitution and they have a higher, like, we wrote a neoliberal constitution in Chile, okay? We did a coup, we did all of that, we were awful to Chile, and even then, they still have a higher labor union participation in that country than we do here in America. Yeah. Because... And by the way, you can trace sort of, uh, like... The labor, labor unions in this country also used to be like the central infrastructure for the Democratic Party, yes. right? And that's yes. why, and you, that's why you had a lot of people. And when when as unions declined, that's when the party lost a lot of working class people. It's yeah, no absolutely. coincidence, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Manufacturing went overseas. Uh, you know, capital owners wanted to squeeze out profit. Profit rates have a tendency to decline. I didn't come up with that. Some other bearded dude did 200 fucking years ago. He was right. Um, and then another guy said imperialism is a necessity for uh, to ensure that, you know, profits stay stable, even though it's constantly declining. Another guy who was bald and had a mustache said that. Um, both of those guys are very smart, I think. But regardless, um, this system is designed in a way to to continue that to continue finding profit wherever and if you are doing that kind of devastation overseas it's inevitably going to come back yeah if our military is being brutal and awful in places like iraq and afghanistan if we have 700 military bases all around the country and we're doing like direct violence direct acts of violence in places that are overseas we're sending you know twelve thousand young men and women to die in uh, in the war on terror right um and and uh, hundreds of thousands more to come back uh, in a state of di like it, it, just in a state of of constant PTSD. You know, 22 veterans are killing themselves every day. Like all of this stuff is happening so that uh, the 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 bottom line of corporations is is protected. That shareholder value is protected. Uh, that global capital ends up uh, you know behaving in the way that it's supposed to. This is a very powerful structure that we've designed. Um, and it's so in it's so great in in maintaining its stability. Neoliberalism is great at maintaining stability. Uh, that uh, that even when you speak out against it, like people who don't benefit from it at all will come out, come out and like speak out against it and and yell at you, and say that you're in the wrong. 
Do you um do you see yourself as a as a political activist? Like how much no. do you feel like your role is to get your audience involved in politics at all or like how do you how do you think about that? I think a lot of people in my audience do get involved in politics. Um they become labor organizers, they become community organizers, they run for, you know, local office and whatnot yeah. and that's great, but I see myself as just some guy. That's the way I see it. Um I am uh, you know, I am what would happen if you were a, like a like an influencer who just uh, I guess read capital and and uh, you know just kind of went along with it. What drew you to Twitch as a platform? I play video games or I used to. I don't really play video games uh, online as much. I still do, but offline. Um, but uh, I I saw the space. I knew that the space was very diverse, but unfortunately the output from like uh you know video game essayists and commentators were like in incredibly right wing yeah and i think that they were radicalizing a lot of people um and and uh youtube probably played a big role in that too like the youtube algorithm but i saw that and i was like this is not right this is not correct i think there are a lot of people that also would understand my perspective uh and would probably mesh better uh with my uh world view than these like neck bearded divorced dads <laughs> that are talking about, you know, uh, the, the great replacement, uh, and, and, you know, having Richard Spencer on, yeah. uh, those guys are fucking weirdo losers, you know what I mean? And I mean, they're not real gamers either. The other thing with Twitch is that it's all like, it, it's live. You're interacting with your audience in real time. Like I spend a lot of, I spend most of my week prepping for all these podcasts. I like get to f spend a lot of time thinking about what I want to say, how I want to respond to the news. You're just like responding in real time. What is that like? <laughs> I mean, that was also part of the reason why I got on Twitch, because originally when I was at the Young Turks, I would write for Huntington Post, and I would write all of my scripts out, and they were all, uh, you know, pre-scripted, all the assets that I would collect and whatnot, and then I would make these, like, short five-minute videos about one particular subject in the news on that day. I, uh, I, I wanted to get better at off-the-cuff commentary. Like, I was just, I had all these ideas... Uh, I had all these opinions, but I could never communicate it adequately when I didn't have this crutch, you know, a yeah. teleprompter. So, or like when you're self-editing all the time, too. Yeah. That's the other. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I wanted to get better at free flow conversation. And uh, what better way to do that than, you know, just putting yourself in the in the crossfire, putting yourself in front of the crosshairs of thousands of people for an uninterrupted 10 hours where you can't have any sort of dead air. That's sure. why I don't shut the fuck up. If you noticed, you, you have me on the podcast, I rolled out of bed, <laughs> I didn't do any prep work for this, but I haven't shut the fuck up at all. But I'm sure that you also are, are it, it's strengthening the relationship with your audience because you're always responding to them, right? Like I, we, for sure. We do live shows and then we get to see people and it's the, one of the best parts of doing this because I actually get to talk to people, but you don't get that feedback all like in real time all the time it, it yeah. must be nice to actually have that sort of yes and no i think it it's really great and it helps me recenter my focus uh but it also can be bad because people can like weaponize that yeah. like they can use that against you and like come in and say like insane shit uh just curious is the phrase that uh we make fun of all the time where people will be like huh, why did you buy a seven trillion dollar mansion in west hollywood just curious it's like <laughs> No, you're not just curious. Like that wasn't a question. Also, you're... it's like like ten jokes that everyone uses over yeah. and over again that are really not that funny anymore. Yeah. Um, someone once described you in an article by saying Hassan consumes the internet at the speed of the internet. Uh, this show is called Offline. We talk about being uh, uh, extremely online and and how to unplug. Does it ever get exhausting? Like being online, consuming content constantly, constantly. Like, do you ever try to unplug? Um, sometimes, uh, burnout is very real and I do, uh, go live for eight hours on the minimum every day, seven days a week. That's so long. And I talk about politics for a big chunk of that. Uh, some ways to, to mitigate that is by shifting my content on the, on the tail end on like after hour four, five, six, try to do some more lighthearted com like, you know, fun commentary, yeah. uh, play video games every now and then things of that nature. And, uh, you know, there's still politics kind of involved in it because it's just who I am. I can't turn it off. But overall, um, you know, that's one way to to mitigate burnout, like to, to combat it. And then sometimes I just take a day off, you know? That's good. Um, and, uh, and on the day off, are you not looking at the news all the day long? 
Uh, usually I am more aggressively, but lately I've gotten a lot better. And now with uh, with the puppy, it's like impossible for me to look at the news nonstop. So that has actually been kind of helpful. Yeah. Um, Puppy's a good distraction. It's a good yeah. way to unplug. Yeah. And I, I have like a social life. Uh, I, you know, I have this like rigid work structure that I, uh, that I, I uh, definitely follow aggressively. But that work structure also has like blocks that I have uh, for working out, for example, and like socializing. Uh, so I, I, you know, get some sunlight. I work out, out outdoors with my trainers and, you know, I, I have... I play basketball, I go to public parks. Um, you know, those are things that I think keep me a little bit more uh, grounded. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I do stuff like that, even though I do have the the perfectly broken brain for eight hours of uninterrupted commentary while I'm like, uh, you know, processing information at the speed of the internet. <laughs> uh, Hassan Piker, thanks for uh, joining Offline and, uh, and good luck with the puppy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. <laughs> of course.